Good morning. We welcome you to online worship with Lexington United Methodist Church. We are glad that you're with us, whether you are a regular member or you are visiting. We hope that God speaks to you with this word and worship. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He then said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He then said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible... May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He then returned with his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Immediately while he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief's priest, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him and at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You are also with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people, There, this fellow was with Jesus of Naz Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. For with the rooster crows, you will send me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. At daybreak, the chief priests, with the elders, legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin, formed a plan. They bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, That's what you say. The chief priests were accusing him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Aren't you going to answer? What about all these accusations? But Jesus gave no more answers, so that Pilate marveled. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and striking him on the face. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their chest and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and the hills cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? When they came to a place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, 
Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man had done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. You have heard it said many times this past month, we are living in unprecedented times. We have never seen anything like this before. Or, I just want this to be over with. I would consider this COVID-19 pandemic to be a season of darkness. We have been living in some pretty dark times. What have you felt over these weeks? Grief, irritable, tired, weepy, foggy, anxious, sad, confused, angry, lonely. I get it. I have experienced a wide range of emotions. First, I was in some stage of denial, and then I just sat with the grief and sadness for a long time. I initially felt guilty about my own grief, and then I felt a bit paralyzed by the overwhelming uncertainty of it all. And then I finally gave myself permission to sit with my feelings, to actually allow myself to feel the waves of emotion crash over me. On the whole, we are a society that does not do well with darkness. Many times, and I feel like this is particularly true about Christians, we tend to rush people into hope instead of, instead of allowing them to sit in the dark. And the same is true for Holy Week. We wanna rush through the uncomfortable parts and jump to the end of the story where we're all happy and we celebrate together. Honestly, one of my biggest pet peeves is the fact that our spring break typically falls on Holy Week. We need Holy Week. We need Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday because without them, we cannot have Easter. It's easy to go from Palm Sunday where Jesus is riding into Jerusalem and being welcomed by the crowds to the next Sunday celebrating that he has conquered death. But we can't skip ahead because we have to allow ourselves to sit here in the pain, in the suffering, in the grief, in the unknown. We have to hear the story. We need to sit at the feet of Jesus alongside the Marys and Martha to weep and to feel the overwhelming sense of grief 
for everything we have lost, for what we do not yet know. Before, everything was fine. Now the world has turned upside down. Christ is arrested, mocked, denied, put on trial, and killed. It is an unbearably gruesome and sad story. Much like how I've been feeling recently, I want to say, I just want this to be over. We know that better days are coming both for us and for Jesus, but we just aren't there yet. The whole world has been living in a perpetual Good Friday. We are ready for this virus to go away and for us to get back to normal. We are ready for some good news again. Our own post-virus resurrection story. But yet, even so many of us has, have resisted adapting to a new normal because we might succumb to the darkness. If we stay still for long enough, we might see God move in ways we have been ignoring. If we don't have enough to occupy our own headspace, we might allow these wild thoughts that we've pushed down to resurface. To sit in the darkness, to sit with pain, grief, fear, or anxiety, to be still or quiet, and to fully experience Good Friday is not a lack of faith. It is a part of being human, something even Christ allowed himself to experience. It is allowing God to work in ways we cannot see or know. God is going before us, doing and creating things, things unknown to us. God is within us. God is with us in the light and in the dark. Barbara Brown Taylor found herself in a cave in West Virginia, and she made a memory of it in her book. The book is called Learning to Walk in the Dark, and this is what she wrote. By all accounts, a stone blocked the entrance to the cave so that there were no witnesses to the resurrection. Everyone who saw the risen Jesus saw him after. Whatever happened in the cave happened in the dark. As many years as I have been listening to Easter sermons, I have never heard anyone talk about that part. Resurrection is always announced with Easter lilies, the sound of trumpets, bright streaming light. But it did not happen that way. If it happened in a cave, it happened in complete silence, in absolute darkness with the smell of damp stone and dug earth in the air. Sitting deep in the heart of Oregon Cave, I let this sink in. New life starts in the dark, whether it is a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb. It starts in the dark. God is creating new things in the dark. God is working miracles in the dark. God restores in the dark. God heals in the dark. In the pain of Good Friday comes something wonderful. Yet we are so afraid to be moved by it. I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light, says Barbara Brown Taylor in this same book. Things that have saved my life over and over again so that there is really only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. What is it that God is doing 
in the dark? What new thing is God doing? What is God stirring inside of you? How is God breaking you open and mending you back together? Reflect on some of these questions, whether it's about this current season that we're in or whether it's another season in your life. We are all in what feels like an unending Good Friday, where the world is dark and uncertain, where we feel more grief than we do hope. But God works in the dark. God creates in the dark. God lives in the dark. God resurrects in the dark. Lastly, Taylor says, this even when the light fades and darkness falls as it does every single day in every single life god does not turn the world over to some other deity here is the testimony of faith darkness is not dark to god the night is as bright as the day my prayer For all of you this season is that you make time to celebrate our new reality and to grieve that reality and that you know that you are not alone. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for worship. I hope that each of you continues to be well. Leave with this benediction. May the God who creates us, redeems us, and restores us be with each and every one of you until we meet again. For more information about our congregation or for events happening here, for what we're doing in the meantime, please continue to check our website, our Facebook page. You can find those links in the video description or here on this graphic. Take care. Bye-bye.